right, and uh, and we're live. Welcome, guys, to episode five. Is it five? Something like that. Quattro or cinco. cinco? I'm not sure. And actually, it's coming up to May as well, so it's possibly Cinco de Mayo sometime. Ah. Today, man. <laughs> Tremendous. Or for all those uh, Mexican listeners out there, I'm sure there's plenty of them. But um, all right, guys, welcome to the fifth episode of Reactionary Opinions. It is the 8th of April, 2019. Dylan's here. Russell's here. We're going to have a fantastic conversation today. We might be getting a little bit more controversial than normal, but that's good. The more controversial you are, the more views you get, right? YouTube crowd. Mm -hmm. So, um, hey, good news, guys. You want to hear the good news? You're supposed to Hell say yeah, of course. For sure, for yeah. sure, for sure. Okay. So the good news is last week when we made our last video, we were on a whopping 12 subscribers. This week we're on 30 big name subscribers. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm still getting the word out there. You know, my, friends, <laughs> my friends are subscribing. I'm yeah, that's good. Still there. that's good. We're still, we're still targeting friends and family at the moment. Eh? <laughs> Tells you how many friends and family we've got. We've probably only got 10 each between the three of us, eh? <laughs> We're getting there, man. I hey, I don't know, I don't know most of these people, so yeah. they're all new to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, guys. So uh the topic of discussion today is an interesting one. We're going to be talking about the welfare state, more specifically, mm. how the welfare state sucks ass. Okay. Mm. <laughs> and how destructive it is and all of that. So how we're going to be doing it tonight is uh, we're going to be going chronologically. So we're going to be dealing with the welfare state and sort of uh, what exactly the welfare state is, the history of uh, the welfare state. Then we're going to be delving into the welfare state in South Africa and the disastrous effects that the welfare state has had on in South Africa. And then we're going to be talking about the morality of the welfare state. We're going to be talking about taxation and the welfare state. And then we're going to be talking about the mildly plausible arguments for the welfare state. It's a tough one, that one, because I don't think they're very plausible, but they are mildly plausible arguments for it. And then we're going to be talking about the good ones, the why nots, why exactly the welfare state sucks, okay? Mm. Um, and we're going to be going into quite some detail with regards to that. So buckle up, guys. It's going to be a great ride. The first point, I will tell you guys that I am not too clued up on the history of the welfare state, but the first point is exactly, is simple. What exactly is the welfare state? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people ask what exactly the welfare state is. And pretty simply, the welfare state is the use of government revenue. In other words, taxation, so money that the government steals from their taxpayers, because taxation is theft, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> As they say, yes. <laughs> <laughs> to support those, so the use of government revenue in the form of taxation, to support those who supposedly are in need of financial or social needs assistance. Uh, issue that I have with that personally is that it essentially allows the government to determine the level and quality of services provided. And we all know government can't pretty much can't do anything. Now we want to let them give us education, healthcare, all of that sort of stuff. I don't know if you guys want to um, elaborate on, on that. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the history of it. So, mm -hmm. um, of course, as Scott said, you know, um, we all kind of know what Wherefill is, social grants, some old age pensions, and so on and so forth. But the first country to have what we would consider to be some sort of state-funded social welfare scheme was actually Germany. Yeah. In 1889, Otto von Bismarck, who was the chancellor of the newly unified German Empire, um, installed old age pensions, basically. So it was, it was basically like social security. Um, so it was not the 
large, vast, sort of expansive, um, you know, uh, far-reaching plethora of programs that South Africa or the U.S. or most of the world has nowadays. Yeah, it's pretty so limited. It was it was limited. It was limited strictly to pensions, right? Yeah. So there was, was no there was no free healthcare. It was um, yeah. It was an old it was a it was an old age social insurance program. Was basically what it was. So if you're old and you know, just to sort of take care of the um, destitute in their old age, it was it was it was sort of a. Uh, uh, you know, take care of those sorts of people who, who in their old age might slip through the cracks, basically. Cool. It's interesting Russell? enough, as far, as far as I know, that um, the age of a pensioner back in 1889 that Otto von Bismarck implemented was 65 back then, yeah. because very few people lived after 65. Yeah, so you know? you so, 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 yeah, yeah. we're 100 and something odd years later, and we've got the same uh, uh, age benefits, so, you know, with life expectancies having increased dramatically the last century. Yeah, so, so um, you were, I think, that I actually, I'm not 100% sure of this, but um, the idea was that when you um, reach the age of 65, you were only expected to at most live to 68, 70, all right? And it was just enough time to wind up your affairs, not do any work, and live out in your your live out your last days in like what they like to call dignity and that sort of thing. That's what my understanding of why um, Germany did that in the eighteen eighties. That's what yeah. I understand. Or maybe you you're a little bit more clued up on the history of it. But no, I mean that that that's essentially correct. And even even fairly recently, social security in the United States, which is kind of the American version of that, and of course Germany has revamped the system because I mean they, because they they had just gone from all the German states, Prussia and Saxony and all that, shortly Bavaria. before this, yeah, and then they had made the German Empire, and then they had the Weimar Republic, and then they had the Third Reich, and then they had the you know modern day German federal state that they have today. Correct. So they've gone through a lot of changes, and the programs have changed, of course, naturally, with those changes of power. Uh, the U.S. has had so that was sort of where, not to get off topic, but uh, that's sort of how welfare got started um, in the United States. They introduced some really big uh, social welfare programs. They the U.S. introduced their own program called Social Security during the Great Depression in the 1930s. That was one of um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, one of his hallmark pieces of legislation. Uh, it makes up most of what I pay in taxes to this day. <laughs> Damn you, FDR. Damn it. So, um, and it was also an old age pension system. And the, the idea uh, at the time, they say, oh, you know, it's just totally sustainable. And even at that time, people would live maybe five to ten years afterwards. And I remember something uh, noticeable for my dad. He, my dad works for a – my dad's a mechanic, and he's part of a, a union. And the a average amount of withdrawals that the average union member took upon retirement only like two decades ago was – it was not that long. <laughs> it was, it was, they basically lived about – Five to ten years, maybe fifteen, and then that was it. So, um, what's interesting about that, Dylan, that you mentioned is that um, obviously, you know, the welfare state, because we got we, we got we got to understand this very. It's very important for people to understand that the welfare state cannot exist without without taxation, because the yeah. government does no way of generating any revenue apart from generating taxation revenue. So it's quite it's quite interesting that income tax started in what is it nineteen thirteen or something. Yeah, in the, in the state, U.S. Right? it was nineteen thirteen. Mm -hmm. There was no income tax before then, and um, w when it really got kicked off, so we had Social Security, but then in in the nineteen sixties under Lyndon LBJ, Lyndon Blaines Johnson, who was president during um, the Vietnam War, for anyone who's oh, South oh, African God. listening. Uh, he introduced what was called the Great Society Project, and and the the there was a slogan for it. It was guns and butter, so <laughs> arms spending and military ramp up and welfare at home, <laughs> and um, 
this is when things really started to kind of go off the rails. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll get into the bads of it later, but you had um, mm -hmm. social. Uh, in addition to social security, you had child welfare grants, much more sort of um, income based. Uh, food stamps at a national level, all th things like this. Was this was 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 this um, was this particularly? Um, I want to I want to talk about the, the the black community in the in the United States because yeah. we all know how 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 much havoc the um, welfare state has wreaked on the black community in the United States. And was this was that sort of in the 60s and stuff were those sort of welfare um, welfare policies and stuff implemented and directed specifically at black people or was it broadly across black and everyone in the United States I think what ended up happening is this sort of coincides with the civil rights movement in the United yeah, States it all happened at the same time yeah so black Americans comparatively were poorer than white Americans. They're also more concentrated in certain areas, urban centers, um, places, some, some, some pockets in the South, but mostly uh, the black Americans who were targeted were in urban centers like New York City, Kansas City, um, Chicago, places like that, Washington, DC. And I think part of it was kind of what you had in South Africa almost. <laughs> so the government's like, hey, we're sorry for treating you like shit. You know, here's some money. You know, I, I hope this makes up for it. And, um, but yeah, the, the, black, the black community in the United States was targeted, especially uh, by welfare. So well, another, I, I, another, I, I, hmm, carry on, Russell. Another very interesting thing that I heard, uh, uh, Dylan, and maybe you could, uh, 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 I think you quite clued up on this sort of thing, is that. Another reason why the social welfare um, exists within countries is because it's often referred to as the social contract. In other words, um, it was a way of um, getting people into a, a national net. Um, it was a way of uh, getting people to... Um, consent. <laughs> consent, yeah, because basically, if you think about it, when did they start issuing things like ID numbers and social security numbers right. and all this sort of thing to actually keep track of everybody and, and to actually kind of buy people's consent? They gave them welfare. Would that, is, is, is that a possibility? That's it's right, when they started giving them free shit, supposedly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it happened more or less at the same time when, when you, because think of it up until I think the First World War around those sort of things, you didn't have like the, the uh, real population registration and citizenship and the intense uh, uh, sort of things that you would have had uh, uh, today. It all started at about the turn of the 20th century, um, all these sorts of things. And it, it, it kind of like, uh, it was kind of, it could have been that social welfare was brought in to buy off the people, to get them to buy into this. Uh, we're going to get you into the system. We're going to get you numbered into the system. We're going to give you the benefits of citizenry. So basically, if you are a, it, 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 there's some people that go as far to say is that nobody can say they're not a socialist because as soon as you're a citizen, you're a socialist. Absolutely. Yeah. I think Russell, social the, the social contract and stuff is essentially the way that the that the government used to sort of trick people into paying taxes. So I get I get what you well, say that as well. That that uh, the, the social contract uh, or or that the, the the technicalities of the social contract contract with regards to the welfare state is um, is quite. They all kind of tie up on the timeline. The timeline kind of uh, um, uh, looks like it lines up if you look at it. Uh, uh, Correct. Um, social welfare, taxes, all those sort of, all uh, with population registrations, all those sorts of things, they, they kind of like come fit nicely all together. Yeah, um, yeah no, the way it worked is you had, in the U.S. at least, and this is actually true for a lot of places, but as soon as you had central banking kick in, then that provides the fiduciary means by which they're able to bankroll these programs. And mm -hmm. then... And interest. Yes, exactly. Usury. 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 <laughs> Usury. <laughs> Jinxed. Jinxed. <Yeah. laughs> so, um, <laughs> that's such a great word. Um, <laughs> it's like degenerate. It's right up there with degenerate. Yeah. But uh, 
No, I mean, these things are all tied together, of course. So once you have it, the income tax come in, which coincided with central banking, then, of course, the people aren't unhappy about, are unhappy about it, so you give them something to sort of buy them off, essentially. And then you tie into that social security numbers by which you can track them and hold them accountable and make them pay their taxes and stuff. Yes, an interesting. Look, it, all, it all ties And I'm together. sure they will never say that, but that's the effect of it. Correct. In other words, the social contract was, we're going to register you. You're going to be a citizen formally. We're going to have, um, uh, uh, we're going to get you into a registration system. You're going to get benefits, and we're going to tax you for those benefits. And that is, yeah. we, you pay us, we pay you back kind of sort of thing, you know? Yep. No, that's for sure. And, and we're going to borrow and we're going to borrow any deficit spending from our central bank. We're mm -hmm. going to print it. Exactly. And the other thing too to keep in mind and I didn't know about this until fairly recently and this just goes to show the extent to which um, the 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 very existence of the welfare state has sort of shaped our thinking and limited our imaginations a bit is in the United States while we're still on the history subject, there were a massive amount of fraternal organizations that existed which served basically the functions of the welfare state now, except they were a hell of a lot cheaper, were less bureaucratic, and had a lot more accountability both for the organizations and the members. Well, so, fraternity, fraternity and spontaneous order is exactly how you get rid of the, the welfare state. Yeah, and uh, and we'll 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 talk about this a bit more when we get yeah. into the bad parts of the. Um, yeah, the, but he has, a, he has an interesting he has an interesting thing with regards to the the in the U.S. and stuff. So still on the history of it, did you know? Okay, so after slavery, so when when slavery was abolished and all of that, I think it was what eighteen. What is it, Dylan? Eighteen sixty-five. Yeah. yeah. So from from eighteen sixty-five or whatever to uh, to the 1960s, black black communities thrived. I mean, in the, in, the, in 1948, apparently black unemployment or black teenage unemployment was actually less than white teenage unemployment in the United. That's States. true, and they went from yeah. totally mm -hmm. illiterate almost to full to almost full literacy in a generation. Exactly, which in is a generation what South Africa yeah, well, has now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, look, I mean, the thing is. They said in the 40s and 50s, the um, the amount of uh, uh, um, uh, black Americans entering the middle class was completely unprecedented ever. Yeah, you know. No, the, um, the they, rate... they they were doing there was there was a there was a huge shift, you know, happening um, in terms of in, ever increasing affluence and education levels and. They were even in the 1800s. In the late 1800s, they were even some black millionaires. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. And, yeah, and um, I think, and I think, I think the, the the first black universities already got established in the late nineteenth century, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yeah, uh, there was or the a earlier twentieth century. Some famous um, guys in that field were George Washington Carver, uh, W. Uh, e. B. Du Bois um, was another famous guy. So yeah, there was um, there was a lot of uh, sort of things happening post post emancipation in this regard and you know like i said full almost full literacy within a generation uh youth unemployment rate was lower than uh oops, sorry than um white youth unemployment and marital rates were at parity with um white marital rates and you had rising standards of income the entire time despite yeah, segregation mm. yeah well so in other words it was in spite of everything uh, uh uh, uh, coming from the base that they were coming from and all that yeah. sort of thing, they were running a very good race. Yeah. 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 Tremendous, tremendous growth. Yeah. So um, that's that's pretty much, I mean, look, I don't think we need, really need to um, focus too much on the history of it and, and stuff uh, specifically in the United States because it's, mm -hmm. we're going to get, we're going to get into the, the history of the United States and the welfare state in the U.S. and how it, sort of ripped apart black communities and and all of that specifically black communities in the in the u.s and all that we're going to look into that um in a little bit more detail but what i want to talk about is i want to talk about um the 
the welfare state in South Africa and where it comes from. Mm -hmm. So the big misconception. Oh, of, and just uh, one thing I, I'll, mm -hmm. I just want to add. Um, for anyone listening, most a lot of you might be thinking, ah, why, why so much talk about the U.S.? The reason being is that most of the research that's been done for like the good studies on comparing the effects of welfare on minority groups in the U.S. in particular has not been done in South Africa. A lot of these studies just don't exist. So although we can pull up statistics from, uh, you know, um, a certain time, time frame and then compare it to now, um, a lot of the research just hasn't been done yet. You haven't had sort of a, uh, a Thomas Sowell in South Africa sort of crunch the numbers on this sort of stuff. So a lot of the, the stats that I'll be talking about specifically will be from the U.S. context, but a lot of it you can draw a lot of parallels between. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly what I was going to say. We have to, we have to be able to draw some sort of parallel uh, in the sociology of the welfare state between the United States and South Africa. I mean, because yeah, you can, you totally can. Absolutely, you have to you have to learn how to to draw these parallels so that you can sort of see them and and prep, uh, you know potentially avoid the mistakes that other countries have made in the past. We do. I think that even though we haven't we, we haven't necessarily had a, a Thomas Sowell or a um, uh, Dr. Walter E. Williams kind of person, uh, we are. There's a lot of guys out there that are like. Um, like my our man, Big Daddy Liberty, Sitle and Gobezi. Shout out to you, Sitle, good man. I'm a little bit concerned that you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel. <laughs> we'll get fair, enough. Board. fair enough. And then um, we've got we've got guys that work for the um, for the Free Market Foundation. We've got um, Old Martin van Staden out there. We've got um, my good mate Mpiake Tlamini. Shout out to you, Mpiake. I told you I'd give you a shout out. And uh, he's actually subscribed to our channel. So he's probably going to be listening to this. Well done. But we do have a lot of guys and a lot of voices out there that are speaking up for, um, up against the, um, the welfare state in South Africa. So, Russell, jumping right into it, let's talk about where the welfare state comes from in South Africa specifically. Um. <clears throat> I think in South Africa, it, it, it came about more prominently in the post-war period. Um, I think um, what happened was there was a, I wouldn't call it simple social welfare, but definitely social spending in certain areas um, to uh, lift a lot of, I'm talking now in the late 1940s um, when the National Party came to power, there was a lot of um, spending on the um, what they what they would call the poor white problem, um, <clears throat> and I don't know that that wasn't a welfare situation. It was more a um, a spending on key areas, uh, lots of spending on um, uh, uh, skills development and um, schooling and all this sort of thing. Um, so still, and then still later welfare, on, right? huh? still welfare state. Yeah, yeah. Look, it's it's a socialist state, but it's not that's not necessarily welfare spending. That's not grants and all that sort of thing. They always had um, old age pension grants in South Africa going way back till I think the early, the, the, the early 20th century. Um, uh, they would have had. Um, it started to get ramped up in the late. I think. Uh, it, probably in the 80s already, it's probably started to get ramped up, but I don't remember anything more than, there was no, um, uh, uh, there was no uh, 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 single motherhood um, uh, uh, social grants to have kids and all this sort of thing back before the mid 90s. There was no, um, none of that. Um, there was, uh, there wasn't a massive um, social net. There were a number of people on social welfare. Um, I think Dylan pulled up the stats here. Let's have a look here. Um, well, interesting here. thing is in South Africa, it seems like we sort of followed suit directly after the United States because income tax became law in South Africa in 1914, actually. Well, South Africa was the, South Africa was the second or third country to have a central bank as well, I think. 
Really? Uh, uh, I think our central bank came in about 1921. The South African Reserve Bank came in, like one of the earliest uh, banks, uh, central banks and that sort of thing. Um, let's just have a look here. Um, I think what is it? We saw here. Dylan, oh, Dylan's gave us some stats here in South Africa. In 1994, we had 4 million people out of, um, in those days, a population of about 30, 30, 32 million on social graphs. Now we've got 16.3 million in 2014. Um, and that's probably at a population of about 54 million. So with a, with a, shocking, with a shocking statistic of probably around about, I, I reckon there's probably about 6 million registered taxpayers and probably only about, Three million that are actually paying tax. Yeah. Now, well, that's the thing, a, you know. Looking at an article from uh, Business Tech, and let me see, when is this dated? This is this is from 2017, but uh, they're based off 2016 numbers. And in 2016, there are 15, a little over 15 and a half million South Africans who had jobs of any kind, and. Mm about 17.1 million were receiving social grants. <laughs> so you have a wow. situation of about one and a half more million people receiving social grants than are actually employed. And the government gets on their podium over there and punts ideas like the NHI and all of that. And it's just, you'd have to be, you'd have to be a, an outright idiot to support that sort yeah. of thing. Because actually, um, uh, what's the Minister of Finance? Is it uh, Tito Mbeweni, right? Yeah, yeah. He actually he actually m mentioned and said that um, actually our tax base is actually declining in South Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, the thing is, um, you know, uh, um, I actually say maybe it's a good idea that they bring this NHI in so we can collapse the... the, <laughs> the so we can get this over with quickly. You know, they must just go full, full blown. You know, oh, so I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you're a reactionary or if you're actually uh, just an anarchist. Or revolutionary. Uh, no, 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 I'm not a revolutionary. I'm not anything. I'm an accelerationist. <laughs> <laughs> he wants it to happen. He wants it to, to happen quickly. Just tear the bandaid off. Yeah, well, Russell. Yeah, Russell, yeah. Russell would get this. Russell would do well with Oak. quickly. Russell would do well with oaks like Carplander and those oaks. <laughs> <laughs> the oaks are gonna oaks listening to this channel are gonna think we're a bunch of what do they call them? Storm fags. Storm fags, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, all all we do is just go go to the shooting range and buy Kruger rants. That's all we do and bury them. <laughs> Just, yeah, exactly. Just scattered all over the Western Cape. <laughs> and our garages are, are all full of baked beans and bottles of water. Just baked beans, Krugerrands, and water filters. That's all. Yeah, Guns. exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to reverse osmosis machine. I'm just going to go and uh, go to the beach and pull up a bit every now and again, you know, just yeah. um, desalinate <laughs> the water. A little solar still out there. <laughs> uh, uh, Russell, um, interesting, interesting thing with regards to the social, uh, well, the, sorry, the welfare state in in South Africa is um, that uh, that book that Walter E. Williams wrote. I think it was called the uh, South Africa's War Against uh, Capitalism. Is um, interesting thing is that you know um, South Africa. Uh, was actually very much a a welfare state um, sort of during apartheid as well. Remember, we we weren't we weren't particularly a a a socialist state, more so a national socialist state. So we had national socialist policies and race uh, policies and all of that. But an interesting thing, Russell. This is an interesting thing that appears in that book. Actually, is that most uh, uh, by far, a, a majority of the white labor unions in SA during apartheid actually supported the welfare state for black people. Yeah, well, it, could, it basically if they would because um, um, they they also supported um, they would have supported the introduction of a minimum wage as well, simply for the same reason because it kept. Uh, uh, cheaper black labor from competing with their members it's exactly that that's exactly the reason why so well, that's well, another way Williams, that going going Ron back to the when explicitly yeah, yeah go, going back to the 1960s the early 1960s when um all of the the, the um all these uh 
national socialist, these grand schemes were being formulated by uh, Dr. Vavut. Um, it's well documented that um, capitalists in the country, like uh, uh, Dr. Oh, not Dr. Um, Harry Oppenheimer and the Anglo-American Corporation and all these sorts of things, were um, devout enemies of Dr. Vavut. Um, they wanted to not have, um, they wanted to, there's, there's, um, they didn't want, they wanted to turn it the, the, the uh, economy into a liberal uh, market economy without restrictions on human movement and all this sort of thing. Um, and the arguments against it were that, um, you know, guys like Dr. Bavut said, yeah, but you just, you just want to, uh, you're, not, you're not any moral type of person, you're just trying to uh, de decrease, uh, flood the cities with uh, cheap labor so that you can get the benefits of it, you know. Mm. Um, with, with, the, uh, the, um, the, with, the, with the Group Areas Act and that sort of thing at the time, <coughs> it had the, when it was, when you had controlled migration to the cities, it, it managed to keep black labor um, uh, unit prices for black labor at the time um, high, um, rather than um, flood it and, and, and de lower the, the average wage for uh, black laborers. Um, so there was this battle that went on um, in, in South Africa, right at the top. It's not, uh, it's not well documented, but um, if you read the if you read the English presses, you must remember the Oppenheimers owned um, every single English speaking newspaper in South Africa. Um, <laughs> but I'm not joking. This is Anglo American Anglo American Corporation owned every single English speaking newspaper in the 1960s, or up until the 90s, actually. The Cape, for instance, the Cape Times and Cape Argus here, the IOL group as it is now, that used to be owned by Anglo-American until the mid-90s. Um, so they had massive control in media and all these sorts of things. So they were very outspoken. The English press would, um, you know, if you look at the newspaper headlines from the time, they would say things for what must go and we've got to get rid of this guy and all this sort of thing. And then he was assassinated. Mm. Things that make you go. Mm. 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 <laughs> so, so yeah, look, that's 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 a that's the social engineering part of uh, kind of South Africa. Um, so you could call that a, a, a welfare social type of situation that we had so, in, in so 50s, before, 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s South Africa. Okay, so we've all decided. We've all. I mean, we we can we can agree that. Um, sort of pre-1994 and stuff, uh, South Africa was already a fairly developed uh, welfare state or fairly large welfare state. Uh, Mike Schussler um, actually said that South Africa is, in his opinion, the largest welfare state in the entire world. Um, it can be backed up, actually, Russell, by the Government Employee Pension Fund, which is actually the eighth largest pension fund in the whole entire world as well. Yeah. Um, it has about 1.3 million um, members and only about 340,000 pensioners on it. So it's a uh, massive, I mean, this, play, this pension fund is probably worth in the, I don't know, trillions. I've got no idea how much it's worth. But um, so, okay, so, so post-apartheid, um, so 1994 onwards, the, the government, the ANC and stuff went on a rampage when it comes to the uh, welfare state. So they just went absolutely mad and, uh, you know, there was free health care. Uh, it's funny, it's interesting that, you know, they're doing the NHI and stuff, but there's been free health care in South Africa for... For years, for as long as I can remember. Yeah. And no, healthcare, healthcare was always a a major point. I always forget about healthcare. When I think more of welfare, I'm thinking of more of grants, you know, child grants, that sort of thing. But healthcare has always been um, well provided for in South Africa, actually. So that's yeah. one part of welfare that's always been there, always. Mm. Across all population groups, no matter where they were in the country, especially primary health, healthcare. Uh, up until even now, has always been accessible and well provided. Yeah. 
Correct. Yeah. No, and you're really right. That's when they, um, after the ANC took over, is when they really ramped up these uh, social these programs. Social programs, and there's a, and they they used to not be that big. There's there was a document, a white paper, I think that the ANC kind of had a, a study about um, social welfare in South Africa and the current state of it and how much they were spending and how developed it was. And a quote from it, and this was published in 1997, was uh, social grants and spending were not considered to be critical social investment priorities uh, in the previous government and were under-resourced. So, hmm. so, that, so it, it just goes to show that for most South Africans, uh, social welfare was not a huge part of um, day-to-day living. It, it was not uh, nearly to the scale that it was now, or that it is now, rather. Yeah, now it's um, now it's they basically industrialized social yeah. welfare and yeah, taken it uh, to the next the next uh, level. Mm. So, so I, mm, Russell, carry on. One of, one of the things that uh, you know. Strangely enough, uh, as, uh, it, it seems to be that a lot of the guys pushing um, social welfare, the reason why they have to push social welfare, I'm just thinking out loud here, is the powerful South African labor unions, um, you know, with them ramping up things like minimum wages and uh, collective bargaining and being quite powerful and uh, maintaining high wages um, in, the, in the labor market. Um, and not allowing uh, um, the market to actually take effect. Um, the labor unions have basically um, said, we're protecting our, our members, all right, but you're going to have to, if you want our support, you protect us and the rest, the rest of the country can just get paid out grants, but we're protecting our members' wages, pay the rest of the population, buy the rest of the population off to keep them happy, rather pay out grants, don't let them work because they are going to come into. So it's kind of like a buy-off. The, the labor unions basically dictate an incredible amount of power in South Africa. So I'm just thinking about it. Maybe it's 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 a matter of okay, we're going to keep these guys out of the labor market, and instead of them being in the labor market, we're going to just kind of pay them off with social grant. Well, I mean, Russell, we all know that uh, 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 unions and stuff shouldn't exist. So. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, the labor unions base, you know, the, when the government says to the labor unions, oh, well, because we do with these people, the labor unions probably tell them, pay them grants, pay them welfare. They mustn't compete with our members, though. That's what they must, they're not allowed to compete with um, the existing labor unions. In other words, in South Africa, the, employ, the unemployed may not complete, compete with the employed. Mm. So um, let's get into the, the the meat of the conversation. Let's get into the the serious stuff over here, which is um, us as reactionary Christians should be probably the most important part of this, which is basically the morality of the welfare state. And you know the morality of it. The problem with it is that it's completely immoral. Um, so here's, here's the issue that I have with, um, with the welfare state, okay? It's funded by government or it's funded by taxation. Government has no money without, without taxpayers, okay? So essentially, this is what's important, is for the government to give one rand to someone, they need to take it from someone else, okay? So I have a problem with that. And us as, as Christians, one of the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt not steal. I had no idea that... Uh, theft is okay um, if it's if the government if it's government mandated. You know what I mean. So um, Bastiat had a fantastic uh, uh, quote, which goes as goes like this. I'm going to read the quote. It says, um, "There is in all of us a strong disposition to believe that anything is lawful. Anything lawful, sorry, is also legitimate." This belief is so widespread that many persons have erroneously held that things are just because the law makes them so. So, I mean, that's, I mean, that, but that's an argument for against taxation. But I, I don't know, for me, the welfare state is, is, is completely 
immoral in my mind. You guys want to elaborate? No, I think from a moral point of view, you know, um, I think it, it's it's easy to, as far as taxation goes, there are arguments to be made to what extent we should have them. You can make pragmatic arguments where, which, you know, I, I would respect where someone says, hey, I get that they're not a good thing, but we kind of need them for X, X, Y, and reasons. Acceptable. But... Um, the, the the extent to which citizens are plundered for these these measures, I mean, is is absurd. <laughs> yeah, they no, don't they get make me up wrong. a huge huge portion of the budget. Yeah, and don't, don't get me wrong. I don't have a problem with um, with charity, and because oh. you know, a lot of people will think will think, oh, you sound so horrible. You don't want to help your fellow man out and all that. And no, that, no, no. That's not that's not what I'm saying. I have no problem with me giving my one rand or whatever it is, or my money to to people. I have a problem with um, um, with with other people using, or, or I have a problem with the government using other people's money to help other people without their yeah. consent. No, that's absolutely true. And th the other thing is, um, you know, thou shalt not steal. The Bible also says, thou shalt not covet. Right? Exactly. I feel Correct. like this. Correct. And I think this plays directly into feeding the sort of covetous natures that we all have. Mm -hmm. And as, as right. someone who, if, if you do sort of receive welfare, a lot of people are much more likely to feel that they're entitled to it, that it's theirs, when in reality it's not. So. Mm -hmm. Well, look, um, when you look at the morality or immorality of uh, the welfare state and, and just if I look at it from a um, what is uh, 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 the progress of a of a group of people uh, and how a, a group of people yeah. forget more uh, pragmatics. Yeah. Let's just look at let's just look at what I like to refer to as natural law. Yeah, um, <laughs> um, it, it doesn't allow um, uh, the natural. Um, survival instincts. It interferes with the natural survival instincts of um, a developing group of people, uh, a nation, a, a, a population, whoever the, wherever they may actually be. It takes away the, um, you know, uh, necessity being the mother of all invention. If there's no necessity to actually improve, there's no, because you're just getting welfare handouts, there's a stagnation and a, an actual fact that a, a, a regression in a group's um, uh, development. Yeah. Well, so, it, it's like Dylan says, Russell, it removes the necessity for things like uh, pragmatism or whatever. He's correct, like, correct. Yeah. But I mean, you know, if you let, let's just drill this right down into into real hardcore uh, basics. Um, if you think about it, in the natural situation, um, what's happened now is the wealthy state has managed to um, marry women off to the state. Um, yeah, single right. mothers are now married off. Now, are now married off to the state. So what happens now is that um, they can, they, instead of having to choose a really strong uh, a partner which to procreate, you know, because women are the natural um, uh, uh, bearers of uh, um, the, the nation. So they are the ones that are supposed to be the agents of uh, natural eugenics. Uh, they're supposed to be the ones that are able to choose the fittest, strongest, highest IQ individuals, the ones that can provide the best, blah, all these sorts of things. But if you marry them off, to, if they're able to just get married off to the state, um, they can actually just go and procreate with whoever. Um, and the idea is that the, the, the nation doesn't advance because the idea behind that type of natural eugenics, as I like to call it, is that um, the men whose genes are not suitable for the development of the nation die out. And they don't get to reproduce. Yeah, but Russell, so, with the with the welfare state, what, what's also, I mean, it's one thing that the woman is is able to have um, no. have children and be supported by the state. Russell, put your phone on silent, man. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, okay. Just, no. So it, it it allows. It doesn't only 
allow women to have children at at the expense of the taxpayers uh, and that sort of thing. But it also a, a dangerous thing, an incredibly dangerous thing, is it removes the responsibility of the man because the man can abandon his family and not feel bad about it. Well, that too. Well, that too. I mean, um, uh, uh, you know, so there's no, there, there's just no responsibility. Basically, it's. It just Russell. It makes the it makes the separation of the family that much easier because there's no glue in between it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is it. You know, so there can never be there can never be a, a um, uh, an improvement in a in a group's um, well being. And uh, I don't believe you can improve the welfare state as we know it today, as it exists in places like South Africa um, and the Western world. Many places in the Western world cannot improve the society as, as a whole. It's just not going to. So this is a very this is a very interesting subject, guys. Because here's the thing: uh, this brings us because this also ties in with the morality of it is the separation of the family unit, okay? Because us again as Christians and um, as uh, reactionary Christians, we basically believe that the most important thing in society is the family, the family unit. So mother, father, children, kind of thing, okay? So. Um, Oh gosh, I've just lost my frame of thought over here. So this brings us back again to the morality of of it because it makes it easier. The welfare state makes it easier for 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 families to be to become divided. Now, the United States. Interesting fact: back to the United States within the black communities and stuff in the sort of 1940s and stuff. The 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 single parent household in the United States was as low as I think it was under 20 percent actually. Yeah. And now it's, I mean, it's something shocking. Like on its head. <laughs> yeah, it's totally flipped on its head. Now mm. um, in the United States, this, to my mind, I complain about the money aspect. These are financially unsustainable programs. They are sort of on their face unjust. But the real thing that really pisses me off about this sort of stuff is the devastating and dysgenic effect they have on society at all levels. Mm -hmm. So as you're talking about with the um, marital rates in the United States, black and white marital rates were literally at parity since, since literally slavery <laughs> up until the 1960s. And what happened? Welfare is what happened. And then you went from a situation where you were saying you had um, – the, the vast majority of, of um, black children in the United States grew up with two parents. That was the norm. Mm. And now you have a situation where about three quarters of them are born to unmarried mothers. Three quarters of them. It has literally turned upside down to yeah. whatever you think. Dare I, dare I say this, Lynn, dare I say this? The black community in the United States was probably better off just like literally five years after slavery than they are today. In terms of marital rates, you're absolutely right. Yeah. That's absolutely true. If you're talking about f f families being intact and... Well, I mean, I'm talking about trajectory. I'm talking about trajectory. I mean, if, oh. they, if, they, if they're carrying on now, their long-term goals are going to be completely screwed and they're going to oh. end up off the hook. You know what oh. I mean? But I'm talking... I'm saying five years after after slavery in the United States, there was very little single families and you're, stuff. Their trajectory was oh oh going. that's what you're yeah no if you're talking about the trajectory, I mean it was it was a rocket ship is what it was. So um, yeah yeah you're absolutely right. The trajectory and then poverty trajectory towards success and poverty is going and down. Marriages staying together, you know. It, Everything's just getting better. Literacy, education, everything's going up. And then, in the 1960s, it slows down, and then 70s, it basically peters out, kind of. And now we've got now we're now it would appear it ended up into a, like a tanking position. Yeah, the no, last it's, 20 years since the 90s, really. It's really, really bad. And in well, South Africa, you see the exact same thing. Uh, similar statistics. So, currently in South Africa. 60 about 62 percent of black south africans when they're born on their birth certificate they have no information about the father now that doesn't mean they are unmarried that doesn't mean they uh 
they have a boyfriend who's not in the picture. That means literally 62% don't even have, it's, it's, they, they, they don't even put the boyfriend's name. They, they don't know who it is or he's gone or out of the picture. 62% of certificates have no father name listed for black South Africans in, in this country. But couldn't, and, that, couldn't that also be because it's easier to claim welfare benefits if you don't have a father listed? Sure. And that oh, could well point. be the case. And uh, if and this sort of lines right up with um, marriage rates also. So mm. you compare the marriage rates of Zulus in 2014, they were about 30%. Jeez. Yeah, about 30% of, uh, according to this, this, what I was reading, in 2014, I think that was in one of the articles I sent you guys. And this drop mm. in marriage rates, um, very similar thing to the U.S., uh, was after uh, welfare started ramping up. So you, you, even when you had the migrant labor system in South Africa where you know, Correct. laborers are sort of taken from their communities and moved around to go work in the mines and whatnot, they still stayed married, you know, they still had um, family stuff. They might not be there physically, but um, they're sending money back home. They're taking care of their families. And then all of a sudden, it just gets an atom bomb dropped on it <laughs> once you start adding welfare. Mm. It's it, sad, it, but it, yeah. it's just so, I mean, to me, it's just, it's, it's kind of like, yeah, this mm. isn't a surprise to me because, you know, I kind of know, you know, what was happening in the United States in this regard. And you have the exact same thing here. You target a group of people with free money who are on an upward trajectory but currently don't have a lot and you incentivize them to not get married in the first place and not have a man in the house and it's just everything just goes to shit and the same thing has happened in the not just with black south africans of course but uh i spend a lot of time for anyone listening, I mean, I mean, you guys obviously know this, but I spend a lot of time on the Cape Flats. My wife's from uh, Mitchell's Plain here in Cape Town. And uh, the amount of single motherhood is astounding. There's mm. just, there's the, we're, it's, it, this is total anecdotal evidence, but we're just sort of going down the list. And like, Lauren, how many, how many people you knew sort of growing up who, uh, who, who, who st stuck it out until they got married and then had kids or, you know, are currently working and don't have kids. And she's like, ah, actually not that much. And just people in the neighborhood, it's, it just has such a corrosive, awful effect. And what are they getting? They're getting social grants, they're getting disability, they're getting child payments and stuff. And, you know, it just, it, and these kids grow up with just feeling like cash cows by their moms and abandoned by their fathers and they're just filled with rage and become gangsters <laughs> this is essentially what happens yeah look, i mean i just you know i mean how do you how do you um the the, the thing what, what upsets me about the whole thing is that how do you there, there, there's we can do something about the tangible effects of poverty and all that sort of thing you know we can do things but it's it's a hard, much harder slog to actually change um, a, a people's outlooks and that sort of thing. This is this is no government can actually do it. I I don't believe uh, any government can actually even fix those problems. Although they they believe they can and they try, um, uh, our civil society has to grip, get a grip of itself and uh, uh, you know through the churches or something you know some sort of a revival has to happen within the communities or. Um, you know, the, the government, look, it, it, you know, it's just not going to happen. I mean, the thing is, people say, you know, gangsterism, like we were having a discussion once, you know, gangsterism being caused by drugs. It's not. It's this sort of thing that causes gangsterism. Correct. Yeah. You know, correct. You know, Russell, drugs, drugs like doesn't, that. drugs doesn't, uh, if it's not going to be drugs, it's going to be racketeering or grand theft auto, parliament poaching or, um, something else, you know, or, 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 or armed robbery gangs or something like that, you know, that's well, what that, causes gangs. That's like, that's why that, that, that book that I'm reading, Russell, um, called Light Through the Bars, that's written by the, a priest that's been working for the last 20 years in, in prisons all over South Africa, even in Polesmore and stuff. And he says an overwhelming majority, probably 80, 85% of uh, criminals 
um, in in like I mean high security prisons like Polesmore and stuff actually come from families specifically specifically that don't have a father. Yeah, and and that's and and you know you you look at that sort of thing and you I mean yes I get that us as Christians shouldn't hate the sinner but we should hate the sin and you know that sort of it's it's an absolutely heartbreaking thing to see these oaks uh, end up in prison and and all of that and it, it like legitimately yes they have the choice but the 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 the, the roughest thing ever is must have to be you know to not have to not to grow up in a in a community an impoverished community where you don't even have a father to support you i mean it's bad enough having to grow up in poverty mm. but if you don't even have a father to support you it's i mean russell we've said this before our our privilege our biggest privileges i mean we don't come from much but our biggest privileges was to have to come from a family where we had a mother and a father that were married and oh, loved yeah. each other and all of that no, well, look, you know, single, single, single parenthood is is um, but unless it's accompanied by strong um, family structures around it, is a very good indicator of um, a, a sustained poverty in the next generation. You know? Absolutely, yeah. It's no. basically what I'm getting at is that if if people are um, if if people are living below the on the breadline or, or or close to it or near poverty or quite not very well off at all, like quite poor, their chances of um, upskilling themselves and getting out of that as a, um, without two parents is a lot slimmer. They then just the certain, then if they've got both parents, you know, Correct. You, you, you just, they are, the odds are stacked heavily against them. Yeah, no, that's entirely true. And <clears throat> yeah, every, every family that I know, particularly, kind of where my wife's from, who, where the kids are doing good, where, you know, they're not on drugs and <laughs> they're, they're all, almost all of them are from married Christian or Muslim families, like yeah. without exception, <laughs> you know? So well, and it, makes, it is... makes you think, I mean, people, people will say these things are just sort of strictly coincidental, but you know those sort of scenarios and those sort of ratios are. I mean, you have to something else. Just you have to stop yourself and say, "Well, hang on a second, something." Yeah. Like, you know. No, and I, 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 I think part of the thing too is, and this is sort of the reactionary bit coming out. This is where having that religious and moral grounding is so important, because these are people who could have, you know, bitten the apple as it were, taking the, 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 the poisoned fruit. But uh, they didn't because they had sort of a sense of pride in who they were. They, had, um, they wanted to be self-sufficient. They, they, they have these Christian values. They expect you know, certain restraints on um, uh, as, as far as sexual proclivities go, abstinence, waiting until you get married, all this sort of stuff. You know, I, want my, I want my daughter to marry a nice Christian guy <laughs> sort of stuff. And the people who do try that, you know, they may they may fall in hard times, but usually they make it. You know, the, the the path to a a decent life isn't that hard to figure out, you know. But so many people just 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 don't get there for whatever reason. Yeah, it's quite it's quite it's quite tragic. So yeah. um, I want to talk about the. Um, the plausible arguments, although they are, there are very few of them that um, that can be argued for them. I think one of them is, yeah, it can be a safety net for people, like mm -hmm. you said, Dylan. Like you did make notes of it, it that it can help people as a safety net, and yeah, it helps people out of the rungs and all that. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Check the <and> pro egalitarian. <laughs> yeah, look, look. The thing is, the thing, the, the, the thing is, um, you know, nobody is, uh, 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 nobody wants to be, particularly in our so-called civilized world. Nobody wants to be. No government, no government leader slash politician wants to be seen as a bad person or somebody that lacks empathy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 nobody wants to be seen as that. Um, 
and that is what you are genuinely accused of if you uh, 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 express disdain for these kind of uh, programs and all this sort of thing. Yeah. You get you're a, in, in, in the in the public sphere. You're a bad person. Yeah, you just hate you're poor people. Poverty. Yeah, <laughs> you just hate poor people. You know, yeah, and, um, it, 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 Russell, that that, and, that and no, no, mm. carry on. Basically, you know, we can bring that back to touch on that briefly. In a democracy which is run by public opinion, um, you're in trouble as a political leader. Yeah, there's absolutely no way. In any country where the welfare state has taken hold and you have built up that vested interest of grant recipients, <laughs> there's no way you're going to vote that out. You just can't at that point it, while still being a democracy. So you can either print your way out mm -hmm. of it, collapse everything and say, oh, well, we made a mistake and start from the ground up or you basically have to Mr. Strong, strong man style, just, I'm just going to make things work and I don't care what you have to say sort of thing. Just get, yeah, get, it's going to have to take a collapse, a collapse or a real ironclad, iron man of steel uh, uh, person <laughs> just not, yeah, to, to actually change things. It's like so determined and single-minded. You're not going to yeah. get good luck finding what it is. You know? And just to address the the pros of it, you know, as as Scott was saying, plausible safety net. So that is true. But again, as I said and touched on a little earlier, it's not like safety nets didn't exist before. There's mm -hmm. always been safety nets. Yeah. Biggest one, family. Family is <laughs> your first one. Second one, church. Third, fraternal organizations and mutual aid societies. Black Americans in the late 1800s and early 1900s in particular had were overrepresented in these fraternal organizations. Up to 40% of all working Americans belonged to some fraternal organization, which included um, uh, life insurance, health insurance, the average cost in the 1920s for uh, a fr fraternal society member to have access to a doctor was two days pay. So mm -hmm. two days pay annual, annualized allowed you to have access to a GP and then if you need it, you could go see a specialist. So, and um, the church played a tremendous role in taking care of the congregation. I mean, just recently, here's, I know it's again anecdotal, but this is the way how things used to be done. My mother-in-law was laid off recently. My father-in-law, he's um, a pensioner. They don't have a lot of money coming in right now. And so what did we do? The church and our family all pull together and we're taking care of them until they get back on their feet and everything's fine and they don't have to worry about anything. That's why wow. family is so but important. But you need strong family to do that. <laughs> exactly, yeah. See, that's the thing. And Vicious circle. Yes, and and the best way to undermine that is by giving free money to everybody. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oddly I think, enough. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think, Russell, where you, where you mentioned earlier on about governments and stuff and politicians just wanting to, uh, you know, try and look like good people and stuff, if they really had the the people's best interests at heart they could come up with other ways if they really needed a welfare state they could come up with other things like like a, a voucher system or or something like that so, I mean, something that actually or i don't know i'm just spitballing over here maybe something like um incentivized labor or something like that i don't know to to get people you know um to get people a little bit more motivated and that sort of thing, but still have some sort of welfare state where it's not technically just money for nothing kind of thing. Mm, mm, mm. Look, like you know, it's um, it's a it's it's a horrible situation because if you think about it, people as individuals, we've spoken about the group as well, but even people as individuals, their ability to um, feel good about themselves and and progress as individuals is severely limited under a, under a social welfare system. There's there's no there's no up uh, uh, forward thinking. It, it it is a terrible. It is slavery. It's a, it's a new form of slavery. Um, yeah, that's the other it, thing. It, 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 you call it what you want. It, it, it is actually slavery. Well, Russell, I'll tell I'll tell you. Um, 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 
Uh, gosh, I always forget his name. Um, Dr. Walter E. Williams. He came up with a fantastic thing because he said it is. Welfare state is exactly slavery. And he said, no, what is, people ask, well, what, what is your definition of slavery? And he says you can make a perfectly good argument for, for it being slavery or the welfare state being slavery. Because essentially slavery is the forceful use of one person to serve the needs of another person. So it's basically or the ownership of someone else's production or productivity, which is ex essentially what the welfare state is because that money is basically taking from people that are working and giving it to people that are not working. Yeah. And the other thing too is another another argument people say is it's a it's a it, it helps people give a leg up give give them a make that lowest rung on the ladder a little easier to get on. But what we see time and time again is that it just totally whatever economic libido the person may have had before it just <laughs> sucks it right out of them. That's and a good one. Economic libido, I like that. It just, <laughs> just totally, just totally. Jeez, I've never heard of an expression like that. People, economic libido. Economic libido. It just gives them. <laughs> it, it replaces that economic libido. Basically, with basically, the get a hard on for money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just gets rid of that economic libido and just fills it with soy. <laughs> It just fills him with soy. Yeah. Replaces <laughs> the meat of soy. But, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's not just, uh, uh, no, no, that's a good it's point. not just um, uh, a minority issue in the United States or a black issue or a colored issue in South Africa. You're seeing this play out all over the place. Labor force participation rate in the United States is the lowest it's been since the late 70s when you had stagflation going on. Mm, I'm so, just checking that now on your notes as well. And and and, and, if, and, and people might say, well, you know, if you and, look back in the 50s, labor participation rate was lower even then. That was because women stayed home with their kids like mm. they should. <laughs> Correct. <No. laughs> but, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, like, I'm just going to hear the yeah, well, like, listen, going on over here. Yeah. It, it's uh, like what we, if if we going along with the way we speaking on this uh, on this discussion, we would definitely put family first as the basis towards uh, eventual economic emancipation. Yeah. No, absolutely, and the, the, the oh, shit, I lost my train of thought. Where was I? Where's my notes? Okay, I was up there. Oh yes. So, anyways. The, the the labor force participation rate huge problem and you're seeing it where you see it worst in the United States outside of the black community is in poor rural mostly white areas and you have a lot of the very same problems a lot of welfare dependency a lot of single motherhood a lot of drug abuse op uh, in the United States right now opioids are killing an absurd amount of people and you you've had the same problem in England for a long time poor oh, yes, uh, yeah. or just sort of working class white Englanders are just they they get the welfare money and then it just pff, sucks all the life right out of them yeah and they, they, they the, UK is a, the UK is another story in itself eh? yeah uh, it's, and I mean yes the thing is the UK has a, a or has or a, a historically has a massive tax base and even they can't afford. I mean, it's. It, no. it, I think they. They. What. What do they call it? NHS. There, right? NHI. National. No, it's called but, NHS. Yeah, oh, yeah, NHS. Yeah, yeah. National Health Service. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's yes. busy going through some major problems now. Yeah. So I mean, how the hell? It. How the hell now is South Africa now all of a sudden going to be able to pay for yeah. an NHI? I mean, it's just yeah. Look at look. I mean, the thing is, um, you know, it's the same in South Africa. The debate. You know, you can have. You can have uh, uh, open borders, but you can't have a welfare state and open borders. You know, Correct. And, you know that's just a side note. That aside, you know, yeah. that's just a bit of a we bit of a digression, but nonetheless, we just put that out there. Yeah, uh, and mm, at, I guess no matter how you feel about the welfare state, say you listen to all this and you say, "Well, I don't believe you. I think you guys are all full of shit. Welfare is great." All you have to do is just look at the numbers. No matter how much you like it, eventually this there's going to come a point where this stuff can't be paid for anymore, and it already can't be paid for, and it's being trimmed back all over the world. People like to hold up Sweden as a shining example, but Sweden gave all their programs a major haircut in the 90s, 
for this simple reason. They couldn't pay for it. Finland just did it a matter of months ago. They're massive trimming back of the welfare. The NH, uh, NHS in the UK is having huge shortfalls in funding. Uh, but even the, even uh, those um, even those pl countries like new Nor like Norway and all of those yeah. are backed by massive free markets as well. Yeah, and that's the other thing too. And they have they're getting it right on the economic policy angle, and they still can't pay for it. Exactly. So, yeah. Uh, uh, look, like I say, um, you know, um, you can have you can have things like healthcare. Uh, a publicly funded uh, healthcare, but nothing past really your basic, basic, basic primary healthcare sort of thing. You know, um, uh, you don't. You know, the the argue, one of the one of the argue, one of the fair arguments that I'll give um, investment into public healthcare and public health services. You know, we don't in, in the country that you live in. You don't want to live in a country with high infant mortality rates, as an example. Um, you know, you do actually want to um, have a, a, a situation that if a child gets born, it could not because of lack of primary health care, basic primary health care, um, um, uh, we have high uh, infant mortality rates. These sorts of things, those basics should be taken care of, um, in, in my opinion. I think what the World Health Organization also sets guidelines for public health care, particularly on the primary level. You should, every country should, I'm not, and I'm not, I don't believe, I still don't believe I'm punting social welfare here, um, uh, should have a bare minimum level of commitment to ensuring primary health care to a very primary level. Sure. I don't have a problem with that, really. I mean, if, if that's, if that's where it stops, what I don't, what I do have a problem with is, is free, uh, free government education that I can't, I, I just can't. There's no chance. I mean, because you know, if you if you think about it, if the government's giving you that education for free, where's that education coming from? Who gets to determine the education or the well, level of education? As well, well, we well we can actually have free government education, um, sort of. Um, Yo, Russell, I don't know. I don't. Know. Sort of. Listen, 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 listen. Sort of. Let me finish what I'm going to say. Is this like a? Is this like, a, is this like an episode from Men in Black? Where some alien has taken over your body? Oh, please, Ben. Listen, 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 listen. You, my explanation is very reasonable. Uh, essentially, um, if you had to take this uh, at the moment, um, uh, uh, if you had to take South Africa's complete budget for education. Um, primary and secondary school education. And you had to shut down the funding and issue vouchers to every parent. That would amount to 15 to 17,000 Rand per child for school fees, okay? Now you could actually end up with schools that are, um, that could actually end up charging less than that, all right, for a year's education, if we get it right. So essentially the government then would be funding free education yeah but the key there russell the key there is with the voucher system like i mentioned earlier on with a voucher system is you get to determine where your child correct no absolutely them. yeah absolutely you would then you could even send your kids to a private school and yeah, but private you see that's the would, difference that's yeah. that's that's the big difference i i what, what i have a problem with is it being mandated government education where no 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 that's to go rubbish, to, no, like no, that's a, rubbish. a that's government rubbish. school and they go to a government school within no, their rubbish, areas man. that they live and all that no, stuff. No, that's rubbish. Free. Compulsory education. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no. Look, like I say, um, issue parents with vouchers for their kids, done. Yeah, as long as it's not government-sanctioned education and stuff, no. they're not fine with it. No, look, then it means that people that can afford to send... Uh, uh, um, it can pay double to send them to a more expensive school and all this sort of thing. So it will actually create more investment in private schooling and et cetera. So you'd actually solve the problem that way. And I think this is actually, I think it's also the, um, this is also the ZACP's uh, uh, philosophy as well on education. If yeah. I'm mistaken. Russell, Dylan, um, we've been going for, gosh, about an hour and almost 15 minutes almost yeah. hour and 20 minutes already <laughs> so we've been going for a long time so um i want to just i want to just open it up to closing statements uh you guys can give your closing statements and then we're going to sign off and then we're going to just talk a little bit briefly about our 
our next uh, subject for next week. It's going to be a good one. Okay. So, D-Dog, you want to give your closing statements there, buddy? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, what more is there to say? Uh, the effects of welfare are clear. They have a, without a doubt, a corrosive effect on f familial integrity and the maintaining of a married parenthood. And there's just, there's, just no, there's just no way to dispute that. And with that comes all sorts of other problems, financially unsustainable. And, you know, once, once, you're, once you're dealing with single motherhood, you're dealing with all sorts of other social pathologies. And someone will step up and say, well, what about me? I was raised by my mom or my grandma. And I turned out fine. I'm not talking to you, asshole. I'm talking about... <laughs> I'm talking about I'm making general rules here because that's how you make policy. You don't make policy based on exceptions. You make policy on what are the effects. Not you. It's not about you. <laughs> so, and uh, I guess, you know, at the end of the day, with, with all these things, man's problems are sin, not stuff. So <laughs> you, can't, you can't just start dishing out money, expect these problems to go away because that's not how humans operate and that's how they've never operated. That's how they will not operate in the future. Russell. Yeah, look, I'd like to reiterate a lot of what uh, Dylan said. Our problem is never, it, it, people, the, the, the problem in the world is never a case of there's not enough money. Um, it's more a case of there's not enough people um, living their lives at a responsible level um, and if um, the problem with the welfare state is that it encourages irresponsible behavior because there's very little consequences for um, irresponsible behavior um, breaking up of uh, families um, inhibits um, uh, people's upward trajectories through society they can't really it, it, they're going to struggle to improve themselves um, so my my opinion is there should be no so, so no social welfare. My one caveat would be where I mentioned um, basic primary health care up to a very basic level, and that's it. Um, I don't see any benefits of a social welfare system beyond that. Yeah. No, I'm with you guys 100%. Um, I believe that uh, the welfare state is... Uh, from a from a government perspective and stuff, probably one of the most um, corrosive and destructive systems that any government can petition um, to to think that it that it would result in anything successful is is juvenile um, and uh, and and dangerous. I think that it destroys the family. I think that societies are based on the family model. And it's like Dylan said, you know, let's not use exceptions as the rule. Let's use, you know, um, statistics. Let's use um, uh, actual scenarios. Um, let's draw parallels with other societies so we can see where they made the mistakes and so that we can hopefully not uh, make those mistakes ourselves. Um, I'd like to... Uh, end with a quote by Thomas Sowell. Sowell, Sowell or Sowell, I don't know. I know I know some people say Sowell, Dylan, Americans, you guys like to say Sowell. 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 It's not like Thomas Sowell. Oh, Thomas Sowell, yeah. Hey, Thomas Sowell, you will get your back out of here, Thomas Sowell. I but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> make fun of my uh, American accent. Um, uh, so... <laughs> His quote is, the welfare state is the oldest con in the world. First, you take people's money away quietly and give, what, and then you give some of it back to them flamboyantly. So I think that sort of captures the whole idea of the, of the welfare state is it's sort of uh, dressed beautifully and people will uh, parade it as being something virtuous when it actually ends up just destroying societies completely. It's a scam. Yeah, it's an absolute scam. Like he says, the oldest con in the book. Yeah. So um, 
I'd like to say thank you very much for everyone to who uh, for tuning in and for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found something, uh, some interesting points. If you have any comments, please be sure to leave them in the comments section below. Also, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, share it, guys. Share this stuff with with uh, friends and family. If you if you're watching this and you you find it interesting and it's not an angle that you've really thought about share it with your family tell them about it um, because that's how you get the word out there that's how the battle of ideas gets settled um remember yeah like our facebook page and all of that um instagram twitter not to rush to get it up there but um someday uh, yeah <laughs> so the next topic of discussion for for next week <laughs> Is going to be quite a quite a controversial one. I think we're going to call it actually dem democracy dethroned. You guys want to elaborate on that? Yeah, basically, it's just it's so much in 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 modern society, modern well-behaved liberal societies. You hear the constant, you know, uh, constant adage that you need to have democracy in order to get rich. It's absolutely not the case. <laughs> uh, yeah. It basically, the premise of next show is that democracy is overrated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, yeah. if, if we're talking about material terms, so we're, we're yeah. just going to be taking no, no, a... Look, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to say, uh, you know, they have this, I'd like to have this slogan, no? democracy is good, democracy is good, democracy is a strength, democracy is what makes the world such a wonderful place. <laughs> you know? That's that's basically what they that, that's the mantra, you know. Democracy is good. Democracy yeah. is a strength. Yeah. Democracy yeah. is what makes the world so peaceful. Yeah. yeah. You know? Just yeah. the US the US is just drowning in peace at the moment. Yeah, know? yeah. It's, everything is, you know, democracy does and and I'm you know, to be honest with you, I think we we the uh, one of my um guys I follow, a guy by the name of Mark Farber, a very well known um a commentator and um, economist he basically called democracy he's actually a swiss guy lives in thailand um he said that democracy is essentially a 250 year old social experiment which is not much within the spans of human existence yeah yep. true so uh guys i'm going to end the broadcast there uh everyone thank you so much for listening guys um uh, we'll see you Next week, remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, we'll see you guys next time. Stay reactionary and uh, God wills it. God wills it.